Well, welcome everyone to uh, Stanford University Center for International Security and Cooperation. My name is Harold Trincunas. I'm the interim co-director for social sciences. Um, it's my pleasure today to host an event with uh, some dear colleagues, uh, uh, co-editors and contributors uh, to the Oxford Handbook of Peaceful Change in International Relations. Uh, this is a new edited volume. I think really the brainchild of, of TV and, and Debbie and uh, 40 uh, other chapter authors and contributors, actually more than 40, I think TV will set us straight on that, um, uh, that uh, focus on um, how peaceful change happens in world politics rather than uh, insights into uh, violent power transitions. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to this conversation. I will briefly introduce our panelists. Um, uh, uh, my co-editor uh, and author, uh, Professor T.V. Paul, who's the James McGill Professor uh, of uh, International Relations in the Department of Political Science at McGill University. Um, author of numerous books and articles. Um, I will be linking bios in uh, the chat uh, for people. Uh, we're also joined by Professor uh, uh, Debbie Larson, another co-editor of the volume. She's a professor at UCLA and uh, uh, also, of course, very well published and uh, graduate of the, the political science PhD program at Stanford. So welcome back, of course. And uh, uh, Professor Alexander Getschu, um, who is uh, professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa and Associate Director for the Center of International Policy Studies. Um, uh, each of our panelists will be speaking for about 10 minutes or so um, with uh, Professor Paul introducing the volume, uh, Professor Getschu talking about her chapter on liberalism and peaceful change in international relations, and Professor Larson will be focusing on the role of the United States in peaceful change uh, in the international system. Um, just a quick reminder of the ground rules before we go to the panel. Um, uh, enter your questions in the Q&A function of Zoom. You'll see that in the bottom uh, uh, bar of Zoom. I will come back to moderate the Q&A uh, at the conclusion of the panel and um, uh, read out uh, your questions. Uh, so please go ahead and enter questions at any time uh, during uh, uh, the conversation. Uh, without much further ado, TV, I'm going to turn this over to you to lead off the panel. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be at uh, the CSAC seminar today. I'm actually a visiting, supposedly visiting scholar there, but uh, I'm visiting uh, you via the video through uh, the great organization of Emily and uh, Harold, as well as uh, colleagues there. And I'm really privileged to have the company of uh, Debbie Larson and Alexandra Getschu, who both have played a big role in this handbook uh, that we are about to discuss. So this handbook originated from a discussion we had at the uh, Toronto uh, ISA conference uh, 2000, uh, two years ago about the need for um, uh, a comprehensive understanding of peaceful change in international relations, as well as violent change, the opposite of it. And so we approached the Oxford University Press, which has this handbook series on various topics. I believe Alexandra has a very impressive one on uh, international security with uh, uh, Bill Wolpert. And this uh, is in production now. It will be out although the, uh, in early August, although the chapters are available on OUP's webpage for downloading. We have some 41 uh, chapters on various dimensions of change. And um, we were quite privileged to have a series of uh, uh, a number of scholars from different parts of the world. Uh, from uh, we, we represent a lot of, uh, we made sure that uh, we represent uh, uh, women, we represent uh, Global South. And we were very happy to have a, a mixture of scholars who really bring a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, interesting ideas to the mix. So the idea uh, is to think about past scholarship, discuss the current scholarship and the future emerging scholarship on the subject. And so our aim is to offer ideas for younger scholars in particular, as well as policymakers. So we are indeed serving what you call a bridging the gap or bridging the gap function, as this topic is of much interest as far as we know to policymakers, especially in the so-called great powers of the world. 
Um, as we can see, the biggest attempt at this subject matter occurred in the interwar period. And, um, and that is because of the rise of Germany and um, the fear that, um, that war was uh, coming. And we all know the story of the evolution of international relations as a discipline because of this uh, focus on the subject. Uh, the realist liberal de debates happen quite a bit a uh, function of this subject of peaceful change or not, whether it is equated with uh, appeasement, uh, et cetera. And the two big events were, of course, the Paris Peace Conference, 1919, and then the, uh, the International, uh, Peace, uh, International Studies Conference, which, by the way, was very active during the 1920s and it lasted, I believe, 10 years or something. And it was uh, uh, initiated by the League of Nations and E.H. Carr and a lot of British scholars uh, were big players, French scholars, but very great power centric. So you can see that the evolution of the study of peaceful change has changed uh, quite a bit. Of course, uh, great powers are still the big players here. And today we are, uh, we can talk about the big changes that took place the end of uh, World War II, the decolonization process, the whole idea of the end of the Cold War without a war, uh, and the power transition probably taking place today. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it, will, it will be peaceful uh, in whatever format it will emerge. So there is a contingent um, um, uh, a definition here. And uh, we offer a couple of uh, two types of uh, definitions here, one, uh, along a continuum, minimalist change in international relations and foreign policy of states, including territorial or sovereignty agreements that uh, happen without uh, violence. And uh, uh, the other is a sort of a maximalist transformational change that takes place um, uh, global level, regional level, interstate level, societal level, leading to higher levels of prosperity and justice. So it's not a uh, simple change, but deep change that we are uh, talking about. Then we also talk about a little bit about systemic and subsystemic regional changes. And one of the things that is motivating this enterprise is to go beyond the systemic level, because as we know, IR theories and power transition uh, tend to privilege systemic, systemic theories. And so um, then the, this is actually based on my introductory chapter. We discuss a little bit about the interwar period debate. The Cold War era, despite its uh, intense uh, conflict and rivalry had several uh, incidents of peaceful change efforts. One of them was the detente process but the European countries, in particular Germany, is Ostpolitik, uh, interesting ideas there, or Helsinki process. But the post-war period, post-Cold War period, of course, is a number of uh, uh, very important developments. That's in particular Gorbachev's uh, initiatives, um, then China's peaceful rise strategy, Deng and his immediate successors, the onset of globalization, the rise of new institutions, uh, G20, BRICS, et cetera, but it is changing gradually. This is where the interesting part, I think, why is it changing to into a conflict mode uh, with China and Russia in particular, engaging in non-traditional asymmetric strategies, including cyber warfare, hybrid warfare, um, even the BRI, maybe that is a, uh, both has peaceful aspect to it in terms of power transitions. So I won't go into this as a IR 101, but clearly, there is a, a focus here. And uh, we have very interesting chapters uh, on, on all these uh, isms. I believe uh, Alexandra will talk about liberalism. And what is interesting is, and, and we go beyond paradigms, by the way, we, we discuss uh, English school, of course, uh, the traditional one, but the critical theories, feminist uh, school, international law. We have discussed a little bit of Mueller's work, uh, Fran, uh, Frank Fukuyama's work, Nita Crawford, Steven Pinker. Uh, so we, we bring in all this to give a, a, a holistic picture to this question. And uh, we discuss macro versus micro, episodic versus deep. Um, and um, so in, in a way, this is meant for a starting point for 
uh, many of our, um, our uh, scholars to think about. All these topics deserve more attention from our uh, point of view. And we pick a few sources and mechanisms. We know that there are a number of others, but these are the uh, specific ones that we, we discuss. We uh, also talk about um, great powers, uh, in particular the three that are significant players today. And we try to locate some of the pivotal states. Um, and But the one question that at least in the intro that um, uh, I, uh, I end the concluding chapter we talk about is why great powers abandon peaceful grand strategies. Here, I think uh, we need to study a lot more. Uh, one interesting uh, pathway would be, you know, Debbie Larson is with us. She has very interesting work on uh, status. And the status quest um, probably offers a lot and uh, psychological dimensions to that quest and the unfulfilled uh, aspirations, as we can see in the Russian, and to some extent, the Chinese uh, uh, approaches today. We talk about the regional change and see the first um, one, of course, is considered as the pivotal successful experience of peaceful change. ASEAN comes next, Africa and South America to some extent trying their efforts. But then you have South Asia, you have Middle East without much of a luck with respect to peaceful change. Um, and so we have chapters on all this, interesting discussions. Why some regions uh, cannot change is an interesting subject. We have 41 chapters uh, under seven substantive parts. Three are on historical origins, 10 theoretical traditions, eight chapters on material ideational sources, eight chapters on pivotal states and their contributions, and then 10 chapters on key regions. We have a, a concluding chapter by all of us uh, uh, discussing this subject. So let me conclude by talking a little about this new research agenda that we are hoping to set. Of course, we are not claiming that we are the only people doing this subject. There's a lot of micro works going on. In fact, uh, much of constructivist liberal literature has so much relevance to this. I think still our, our contention is that the paradigm wars, paradigms do not pay sufficient attention to the big picture. We may have to go eclectic. We may have to go interdisciplinary. I think that's a big difference today. In the past, the international law uh, had a, a major domination of the peaceful change discussions. Um, now we have uh, enormous literature in sociology, anthropology, different um, uh, other uh, cognitive disciplines on change, uh, social change in particular. Can we bring some of that literature to this milieu of our discussion? because we need them to understand international change because we focus a lot on the structural or material factors, but that they may not be enough. There is of course the notion of um, emerging technology, cyberspace in particular, but social movements. I think IR is way behind in understanding the enormous impact, for instance, the Me Too movement, the climate change uh, uh, the movements, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of them are playing today. Of course, some of them are in process and progress. But the point is that we need to have a better theoretical handle on how these social movements affect uh, so, so international change, uh, not only domestically, but uh, internationally. And we need better methodology. This was one struggle we had. I think to study change, you need the, the mechanisms, the markers, what kind of uh, methods we can use. And uh, personally, I think uh, we need to know the opposite of peaceful change. Peaceful change is not, a, uh, it's a continuum. You can have violent cycles as we are witnessing today, slowly emerging in different parts of the world. Even domestic societies that we thought had achieved peaceful change, changing, we had a big, uh, a uh, violent incident in Canada just last year, two days ago. And it's, um, um, it just shows that societies need to constantly work on this. Similarly, at the international level, we need to work hard if you want to achieve. You don't have to be a big peace lover to say this, but the point is that peaceful change is any day superior to violent change. 
although not all peaceful change lead to better outcomes. With that, let me stop and uh, thank you for uh, uh, allowing me to go uh, on this topic. Thank, thank you. you so much, Professor Paul. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Professor Alexandra Getchu. Thank you so much uh, for this invitation to be here today. It's, it's really a great pleasure to join you to contribute to this panel, just as it was a great pleasure to contribute to the volume. So my deep thanks to the editors, the organizers of this event, and of course to all of you in the audience for making time. I know it's a busy time, so thank you for being here today. Now, I have to confess, when I was invited to write on the topic of liberalism and peaceful change, I was both excited and a little bit worried. Excited, that's easy to understand. It is a fascinating topic, and it's a fascinating topic, not least because this is a time when we have a growing chorus of voices, both in academic circles and in the policymaking world, talking about the crisis of the liberal international order. So what better time to reflect on the history of the liberal project and the potential for change in the future? That was fascinating. But I was also worried because given the richness, the vastness of the liberal tradition, how could one possibly try to capture that in just a few short pages? And of course, I realized very quickly I couldn't. So instead, I chose to focus on a few what I regard as highly influential liberal ideas of peaceful change, and then examine some of the dynamics and implications of attempts to promote those ideas, both in a historical setting and in a more contemporary context. Now, to, to give you a little bit of a roadmap for this, uh, is what I'm trying to do is again, looking at the historical emergence of ideas of peaceful change in some of the most influential liberal, the works of some of the most influential liberal philosophers, and I focus in particular on Immanuel, the work of Immanuel Kant. And then I look at attempts, historically speaking, to implement those ideas. Uh, and I focus particularly on initiatives in the 20th century. You have, of course, the early instance of the League of Nations, uh, and then the more ambitious set of projects and processes after 1945 a set of projects and processes that gain new momentum with the end of the Cold War. And then in the final pages, what I try to do is reflect on some of the challenges and threats to the liberal order. And I, I argue that what's particularly interesting is that those come not simply from, let's say, external forces, such as the growing assertiveness of illiberal powers, as Tiva mentioned a moment ago, but also developments within established liberal democracies. And this is what I think complicates the future for liberalism uh, and raises some difficult normative questions for all of us. Uh, I, I'd be, again, I can only put a few ideas on the table, but I'd be more than happy to elaborate on each and every of these ideas during the, the Q&A session afterwards. Now to try and link my own chapter to the overall volume, I think it's very important to keep in mind that as uh, TV mentioned in his uh, introduction to this volume, over the past couple of centuries, you have a number of attempts in the world of IR to promote peaceful change among uh, warring states. And to a large extent, that can be attributed to the influence uh, of liberal ideas that are, are rooted in the Enlightenment project with its focus on the need to project reason and humanism in all areas of life, domestically and internationally, and its firm belief in uh, the, the rational being, the, the human as having the ability to learn, to exercise reason and transcend its irrational impulses and build a rational order. So that's, I think, something we absolutely have to keep in mind when we understand the, the liberal tradition. Now, again, very, very hard to try to capture this vastness, the richness of the tradition in a few pages. I'm not going to try and do that, but I think it may be helpful to follow Michael Doyle in identifying a key, few key dimensions uh, of the liberal tradition and starting perhaps with the idea that all citizens are juridically equal, that the legislative assembly of the state has only the authority vested in it by the people and therefore does not have the right to abuse their fundamental freedoms, that the fundamental dimension of the liberty of individuals is the right to have private property, and that the most effective economic system is essentially a market-driven system. Again, some variation, some contestation, but these are some defining principles, broadly speaking. Now, when we look at these principles, it might be tempting to think of them as simply concerning the relationship between individuals and domestic governance arrangements. 
But it's important to keep in mind, as we all know from a liberal tradition in contrast, say, to realism, there are no rigid dividing lines between domestic and international politics. A similar logic, if you will, of action based on the, again, the law of reason is supposed to apply to both realms. And to understand that, to understand the deep connections between individual domestic politics and international relations, we should look no further than, again, as I mentioned in the introduction, the work of uh, the famous German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who was, his, again, we all know, I'm not going to try to, to condense Kant, but just briefly to remember that he, what he was trying to propose with his vision of perpetual peace was essentially a, a move that would transcend some of the limitations of the minimalist arrangements uh, that were mentioned by TV in his introduction. And very briefly, what he was trying to do is to reconcile the tension between a universal international system and a set of particular entities in with particular wills by having those particular entities uh, adopt what he regarded as a universally rational set of principles and norms of governance. And there are, as we now, now know, multiple if not complementary influences, whether we think about essentially other constitutions that put constraints on the ability of the executive, what he calls it the caprice of the executive to go to war, shared moral laws by liberal democracies grounded in, grounded in an understanding of the legitimate rights of individuals and republics, and then economic interdependence that fosters, if you will, uh, transnational connections and gives new incentives to resolve tensions by peaceful means rather than violent conflict. Now, of course, when we look at Kant, it might be tempting to think of him and his work as being in sharp contrast to those works in art that focus on power politics. But a closer reading reveals that, that Kant's philosophy is actually infused with arguments about power. And interestingly, a lot of that has to do with reflections about the process through which the uh, responsible cells are produced and also process of recognition among those so-called responsible rational liberal selves. And this, if you're interested in this, uh, I think the work of critical scholars is particularly useful. I would, I would highlight in particular the work of Michael C. Williams, who has done a lot of work on the, if you will, the critical foundations, the power argument in Kantian philosophy. And this is essentially, if you will, linked to a refusal of essentialism. In other words, through the use of reason, the argument goes, all individuals have the capacity to learn and to govern themselves according to universally rational liberal principles. But the flip side to that is a sense of obligation to learn those norms and rules, liberal rules, and to govern themselves accordingly. And this is also linked to a set of power practices that historically became very prominent. They were legitimized by Kantian argument against those individuals and polities that were seen as having failed or refused to learn rational and presumably universal liberal norms. And this becomes very important because it's one of the most controversial and certainly informs some of the most controversial liberal practices in what can be seen as a liberalism of imposition, using Sorensen's divide between a liberalism of restraint and liberalism of imposition that essentially focuses on the projection of liberal norms, uh, sometimes by coercive and non-liberal means in different parts of the world. Again, we can come back to this during q and &A. Now, of course, when we talk about liberal ideas, these are not just abstract principles. They have a long history of, if you will, attempts of implementation in the international arena. Historical precedents are interesting, but it is particularly useful to look at what happens in the 20th century. Again, an early example, the League of Nations, which is an attempt essentially to infuse rational order into the international society, a Wilsonian, if you will, ideal that's supported by uh, the US, rather the US president, Woodrow Wilson, and Deborah I can say more about that, but it's certainly an idea that's embraced by many liberals uh, in many parts of the world. Fast forward after 1945, of course, that becomes a much more ambitious set of projects with the League of, the League of Nations, if you will, giving the, the principle of collective security that becomes the foundation of the United Nations, but also if we look at the Bretton Woods institutions, NATO, a much more ambitious set of projects. Again, Deborah can talk about the leading role played by the US in that context, but the US was not the only actor in that story. And then fast forward to 1989, where we have a moment of 
And what is widely assumed as the triumph of liberalism with the collapse of communism, the defeat, if you will, of communist ideology. And this gives rise very interestingly to a set of really ambitious Kantian inspired projects of promoting liberal democracy, if you will, reforming society, socializing them into liberal norms, whether in the form of projects, projects of enlargement of NATO and the European Union uh, that come with their own problems and limitations, we'll talk about this in a moment, or the more robust peace building practices that are authorized by the UN in places as diverse as the Western Balkans or East Timor. But of course, contrary to liberal expectations, the story did not end quite simply on a happy note. It wasn't simply the end of history, because what we see is that those processes gave rise to a set of contestations and processes of rejection of opposition, in part because, again, I'm, I'm going back to the introduction by TV, because liberal states and institutions failed to provide the kind of solutions and mechanisms needed to provide peaceful change in deeply divided societies. And what's interesting is that we see those limits not simply in, let's say, far away, deeply problematic societies such as uh, Afghanistan, but we also see it in societies that were seen as really under towards becoming reliable liberal democratic polities, such as those in the Western Balkans. This is part of the story of the current, what is what can be seen as a current crisis. And it's interesting that liberal scholars as well as, as critical scholars talk about a, um, thank you, how, uh, uh, about the crisis of liberalism on multiple fronts. In part, this is due to what is seen as a crisis of authority generated by the behavior of leading states, uh, the US, but not just US, but also what uh, scholars like Tim Dunn has, has referred to as the, uh, the rise of the rest, whether the, in the form of the growing assertiveness by illiberal powers, again, going back to a point mentioned by TV in his introduction, or contestations of the liberal project in the global south in, and in societies that have been at the receiving end of liberal peace building. Interestingly, there's another dimension which is increasingly acute and deeply problematic, which is illiberal contestations in uh, established liberal societies, leading to deep questions about the ability of those societies to promote peaceful change, peaceful transitions. We have the example of January 6th, of course, in the US, but the story goes much deeper than that. And of course, the rise of illiberal influences within the liberal world also raises deep questions and problems for the ability of the liberal security community to address problems raised by the, uh, the rise of illiberal powers. And we have growing concern within NATO due to developments in Turkey and Hungary, for instance, about the ability to maintain a united front vis-a-vis -vis an increasingly assertive project. So uh, that is where we end today. And uh, you know, the question, how does this end? Uh, what does this, how does the story progress from here? It's interesting going back to the most prominent liberal scholars that say what is needed is more liberalism, not less. But they agree that liberalism needs to find better ways of addressing some of its limitations, some of the crises that have come to light in recent years and perhaps have been made even more acute by the current pandemic and also depends on the ability of liberal states to maintain committed to their own liberal democratic principles and to maintain an internationalist orientation. Can they do it? And I think that's one of the most interesting and politically relevant political questions that we're all facing today. It's also a question that's interesting to ask at the moment, as we see the Biden administration stating that really bringing together liberal democracies is one of the most important aims of the administration. And the question is, how is this administration going to proceed and what might be some of the obstacles uh, and challenges? And I think on that note, I will end and use that as a prelude to Deborah's chapter who focuses specifically on the US. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Getchu. Uh, now turning it over to Professor Larson. Thank you again, Harold, and thank you to CSAC and to the audience. Since the 19th century, the United States has engaged in numerous military interventions, especially in the Middle East and Latin America. And yet the United States has also contributed significantly to peaceful change, especially within its sphere of influence. So what explains peaceful change within the US dominated sphere? Possible explanations include bipolarity, hegemony, 
hierarchy, and the liberal world order. In my chapter, I argue that the United States has contributed to peaceful change by acting as a liberal hegemon. Both elements are important. The United States has used its power to promote liberal principles of peaceful change. Examples include the Anglo-American power transition at the end of the 19th century, Woodrow Wilson, and the post-World War II peace settlement. And I'm going to talk about each of these. The Anglo-American leadership transition in the Western Hemisphere is one of the few examples of peaceful change in history, one of the few peaceful power transitions. So what accounts for the fact that leadership was transferred peacefully? It wasn't just similarities in culture and language. At the beginning of the 19th century, Britain was the dominant power in the Western Hemisphere. The United States gradually edged out Great Britain through a series of crises. The United States used a mixture of legalism and coercive tactics to persuade Britain to give up its leadership in North America. This all began in 1823 when President James Monroe issued a statement that the United States would no longer tolerate colonization in the Western Hemisphere, that the Western Hemisphere was closed to recolonization. Of course, this was the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine was a unilateral declaration of hegemony. Now, we don't usually think of the Monroe Doctrine as an example of peaceful change, but it did contribute to peaceful change by keeping Latin American countries out of intra-European power struggles. And as we will see, the Monroe Doctrine figured significantly in the settlement of border disputes between the United States and Great Britain in the Western Hemisphere. In 1895, the United States recommended that Britain submit its border dispute between British Guiana and Venezuela to international arbitration. So what right did the United States have to tell Great Britain what to do? Well, according to the US Secretary of State, Richard Olney, citing the Monroe Doctrine, the United States was practically sovereign on the continent. President Grover Cleveland made a speech in which he threatened to go to war if Britain did not submit the border dispute to international arbitration. Ultimately, Britain backed down. And in doing so, Britain tacitly recognized the legality of the Monroe Doctrine. In 1901, the United States persuaded Great Britain Great Britain to accept that the United States had a right to build a canal um, linking the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. Although this would in effect double US naval power by allowing it to switch its ships back and forth between the Atlantic and the Pacific. Britain agreed because it realized that the United States was prepared to take unilateral action if they did not sign a treaty. In 1904, Britain withdrew its Navy from the Western Hemisphere. In the case of the border dispute between Alaska and Canada, President Theodore Roosevelt sent 800 cavalry to, uh, to Alaska as a show of resolve to the British. Britain ultimately agreed to a boundary commission that decided in the US favor. While the United States used tactics, in each case, the United States was trying to get Britain to agree to some form of neutral legal procedure, such as international arbitration or a boundary commission. The United States did not use its power to just unilaterally seize the territory or, or the right. 
Britain engaged in status accommodation of the United States, a rising power by turning over a sphere of influence to the United States. But the United States had to use unilateral action to persuade Britain to give up its leadership role. Woodrow Wilson maintained this emphasis on arbitration as a means of settling disputes. He synthesized all the principles of liberal internationalism into a coherent ideology made up of components, self-determination, free trade, and an international organization that would resolve disputes. Ironically, the US Senate refused to approve US membership in the League of Nations because they were afraid that it might give other countries the right to interfere in Latin America, contrary to the Monroe Doctrine. So what this indicates is that when there was a conflict between liberalism and the requirements of hegemony, the United States jettisoned liberalism. President Franklin D. Roosevelt laid the foundation for the post-World War II peace settlement and the Cold War order. The post-World War II peace settlement was the most ex successful example yet of the American approach to peaceful change. Multilateral institutions that would manage the economy and resolve disputes peacefully. But while liberal, the settlement also had realist elements. The permanent membership of the UN Security Council was based on FDR's concept of the four policemen. The four policemen included Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. Each would have a sphere of influence in which it would be primarily responsible for maintaining peace. When cooperation with the Soviet Union broke down, the Truman administration launched the Marshall Plan and helped establish NATO. This is an example of the US use of institutions to promote peaceful change. The Marshall Plan required that European countries cooperate in developing a plan for the use of US economic assistance. This was the beginning of the European Union. It helped create trust between European countries that disputes would be resolved peacefully. The NATO alliance allowed European countries to focus on economic development and cooperation without having to worry about intra-European power rivalries or providing for their own security. The Cold War ended when President George H.W. Bush successfully negotiated unification of Germany with Soviet leader Gorbachev, an important example of peaceful change. The idea was that the division of Germany would no longer be necessary because Europe would be whole and free. But Bush never thought of a plan to integrate Russia into the European security structures. Instead, NATO was enlarged and did not include Russia. Russia eventually responded by annexing Crimea, which harmed peaceful change. Attempts to integrate China into the, into the uh, world order seemed to work until recently when economic interdependence no longer seems to restrain China from taking unilateral action, especially in the South China Sea. So in sum, the United States has contributed to peaceful change by acting as a liberal hegemon. But now that its hegemony is waning, the US has to find other ways to state like Russia and China to observe principles of peaceful change. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the panelists. Um, uh, and we have some time now for um, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, please go ahead and enter your questions 
in the Q&A function. Um, uh, I did see a raised hand or two, but please go ahead and put your question in writing in Q&A. Um, and maybe I could open uh, the Q&A session by um, uh, touching on a couple different points. Um, and uh, um, uh, actually, uh, Deborah's point, uh, Debbie's point about uh, the challenge to you or decline of US hegemony and what it implies for peaceful change in, in uh, the international order. TV, you and I have talked about the role that regional arrangements uh, play in contributing to peaceful change and that uh, um, the breakdown of uh, sort of mechanisms to sustain peaceful change at the global level might actually reveal some underlying mechanisms in areas like South America or uh, uh, Europe uh, or parts of Asia that that might become more salient now. But I wonder if you you might want to comment on that and maybe bring in some of the other chapters from the volume uh, 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 to to discuss that. Sorry, uh, TV, can you hear me? I can. Um, I thought the question was for Debbie, but anyway, <laughs> I think the the, the anybody can comment on it. Yes. Yeah. Regional orders uh, increasingly are uh, more important than we think because uh, if you look at the end of the Cold War, for instance, I think the genesis of that is the Soviet failure in Afghanistan. If you look at that prompted Mikhail Gorbachev to um, abandon the particular grand strategy and open up and then consider the notion of uh, Glasnost and uh, Perestroika in particular. But without that uh, Afghan uh, failure, let's put it that way, uh, it would have been possible for the Soviets to continue for some more time. And today, if you look at the East Asia region, Southeast Asia, East Asia region, very critical for the next round of uh, power transition or whatever, uh, whether it will be conflictual or peaceful. And I think that uh, the, the key is to find solutions to the lingering regional problems, whether it is South China Sea, whether it is Taiwan, where, whether it is uh, East China Sea. And in South Asia, you have India, Pakistan, India, China now increasingly. These can draw the great powers into the regions, um, beginning of a new round of rivalries as well as uh, escalatory moves. In Latin America, we can see that too, to some extent, China is increasing its presence. But there are countervailing forces out there. And I'm one of the people who think that the BRI, for instance, may have a, a, a two-side, two uh, it, it may be a two-sided phenomenon, because if the Chinese succeed in creating a kind of uh, hegemony based on that trade relationship, and they don't uh, uh, militarize uh, their uh, activities as the previous uh, East India companies did, then we may have a, a, probably a different set of incentives for these great powers, whether to go to war or conflict. So I do see that um, this relationship need to be studied more and we have uh, to think about whether regional conflicts can be the sparks for great power cooperation or conflict in particular. Great. Um, and uh, uh, let me uh, uh, go to um, Alexandra now, and then maybe actually also uh, Debbie on this question. Uh, uh, Alexandra, you mentioned um, the issue of illiberal regimes within otherwise uh, regions of peaceful change. And here I'm thinking about the European Union and the role of governments like Hungary and Poland. Um, in uh, uh, making European foreign policy, especially one that favors uh, um, uh, 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 unified action, uh, much more difficult. And so I'm just wondering if you could uh, uh, expand on that point. How do you see it affecting peaceful change in Europe, which after all, I think is one of the other chapters in the volume points out is one of the great success stories when it comes to peaceful change uh, in the post-World War II period. And then uh, after maybe Alexander comments on that, Debbie, I wonder if, if you'd want to just comment on what it implies for the United States when some of these projects that achieve peaceful change, like the EU, are now running in these, into these complications as um, 
uh, states within them are no longer on board with the project of peaceful change. Uh, but Alexandra, let's start with you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, great question. Uh, and let me first apologize. My my uh, voice is a bit weak because I come to you straight from a two-hour lecture. So uh, that's why. But I'll do my best to, to keep it going. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating question. And I think, uh, and it's one that we are going to have to address uh, in the coming years, I think. Um, because we do indeed see the rise of illiberal democracy in countries like Hungary and Poland. And, and by the way, Prime Minister Orban of Hungary is very clear about the fact that he is the champion of illiberal democracy. This is not simply a deviation from liberal norms. This is a very extensive, if you will, very clear, very systematic effort to, to challenge the liberal project. What that means is that, for instance, in the process of promoting illiberal democracy, here, uh, countries like Hungary have come a lot closer to Russia. They cooperate with Russia in economic terms, uh, but also in political terms. And there is a, a question of how far this will be pushed. There's also, also growing cooperation with China. And that raises, of course, huge questions about the ability to maintain a united front in Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and China. We already see within NATO there have been a number of cases where it has been very difficult, for instance, NATO trying to define its relationship vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Uh, it has been impeded by the position adopted by people like Viktor Orban. Linked to that, of course, there are developments in Turkey with Erdogan once again moving closer to cooperation with Russia in quite an unprecedented fashion. And once again, that raises huge questions about the ability of NATO to, to, to really maintain, to function effectively and to maintain its credibility as what is known as the most effective alliance in history. Now, this rise of illiberal forces has also generated very interesting questions within the EU itself, because on the one hand, there has been the push by uh, people like uh, the French president Emmanuel Macron for more European autonomy for a greater role for the European Union in the, the field of defense. But this is where he is opposed by another illiberal country within the EU, Poland. And Poland, uh, interestingly, although it shares some of Orban's illiberal ideology, is also opposed to Orban when it comes to Russia. So you see all these nuances playing out, which I think means that, that it's become a lot more complicated to achieve uh, cohesiveness, to achieve any kind of effective policy and, and arrive at common set of practices in the field of defense, uh, both within NATO and the European Union. But let me very, very briefly touch on another point, because I think when we talk about the, you know, the history of the European Union as being a history of success in terms of peaceful change, I think it is absolutely true that you know, what has been happening in Europe since 1945 has been in some ways remarkable, but that's not the full story, right? I mean, we have to remember what happened in the former Yugoslavia, uh, when the European Union claimed that was the, the hour of Europe, and we all know that it ended up in the genocide of Srebrenica and a number of, of massive humanitarian crises and a form of instability that was addressed through the imposition of international administration, but a form of international administration that has, in a way, maintained deep divisions within uh, societies like Bosnia and Kosovo. And uh, regional observers uh, argue that it is far from clear that we can count on the process of peaceful change in the region, particularly if the international community were to essentially limit its involvement which could very well happen for a number of reasons, including domestic constraints, including pressure on budgets, and obviously because of the pandemic. So I think there are a number of fascinating developments uh, that have yet to unfold uh, in Europe, and the story is, is a lot more complicated and more controversial than we sometimes like to think. Thank you. Thanks. And, and Debbie, uh, one more question to you before uh, we go to uh, Ehud's question. Um, uh, for the United States, uh, you mentioned uh, liberal hegemony being challenged, uh, more difficult to, to maintain. Uh, can you reflect on sort of the, the, what this means to the United States, even as its own hegemony is challenged, some of the mechanisms that it relied on, uh, the partners, the allies, the other powers and, and institutions at the regional level are also being challenged. We just talked about the EU in the chapter I, I wrote on South America. I note the sort of the breakdown of consensus on democracy is the, the, the only acceptable regime type in the region, which is something the US very much promoted in the interests of, of 
uh, promoting peaceful change in Latin America. Um, uh, what does it mean for the United States that some of these regional efforts, institutions uh, are breaking down just as its own hegemony, its it sort of uh, liberal hegemony is being challenged? Well, I think the United States needs to be more modest in its requirements for, for states to cooperate, that we can't insist on a litmus test always that the states be democratic and you know ideas about forming a, a league of democracies I think are misguided because often we need um, states that are not particularly liberal to cooperate with us. Uh, and the United States needs to strengthen its own democracy. I mean, this is a you know a major problem with uh, January 6th, the United States needs to engage in more um, concern for its own image and consistency and credibility uh, if it's going to lead. As, uh, as far as, <clears throat> As far as your question about the uh, the implication of the rise of illiberal democracies, I think it's important to note that uh, China, to some extent, is uh, alienating the countries in uh, Central and Eastern Europe by the way it's acted with its uh, wolf warrior diplomacy and you know criticizing and attacking other states and its sanctions against the EU Parliament. That uh, you know China is is. Uh, almost its, its own worst enemy. And the, the organization that China used to get, you know, to get influence over the Central and Eastern European countries, the 17 plus one has a sort of, fa sort of fallen apart. And Xi Jinping re recently said that he thought that, that China should try to be more lovable. Of course, I don't think that applies to the US, <laughs> but, but to other peripheral countries. And in the same way, I think Russia is kind of on, Tinder hooks. There's there's a lot of revulsion against what's going on in Belarus, and uh, Putin doesn't want to be too closely associated with that. So I think we can cooperate with with a lot of countries uh, in Europe and in Latin America that aren't necessarily um, democratic. If we listen to their national interest, if we um, try to persuade, if we improve our own um, domestic situation and don't lecture other countries. Thanks, Debbie. Um, let me go down to a question from, uh, and we have time for, I think, one, maybe two more questions um, from Ehud Iran. He says, thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion. I look forward to reading the book. TV mentioned that peaceful change is a continuum. Uh, Ehud asks, where is the line drawn between, on the state level, for example, peaceful change, peaceful policy changes and a change of policy in light of new power relations or an implied threat by other powers. I have in mind the Chinese goal of getting other actors to change their foreign policy um, following the realization of Chinese power without the need to use force. So how to distinguish between peaceful change, uh, uh, maybe on a normative basis and peaceful change simply as an accommodation to a new, uh, uh, balance of power or relative uh, power uh, uh, you know, uh, adjustment to the international system? I can, I can give it a shot. I think from our point of view, we do not consider uh, these sort of coercive diplomacy strategies of great powers unless it is for a regional transformation to something better. In other words, there is a normative idea behind it. But if the great power or the powerful state is using certain strategies to advance its own individual goals, narrow individual goals, then uh, we don't want to consider that as a collective good in any sense. I think that's the problem of uh, uh, peaceful change if you broaden it too much. And then the other issue is whether the relationship between domestic politics, domestic coalitions and grand strategies. I think here what you're witnessing is the Chinese are probably taking a leaf from previous strategies, including course diplomacy that the US has attempted, uh, not all, all the time these produce peaceful outcomes. Doesn't mean that they don't produce uh, dominance for Chinese up to a point. As it was mentioned by uh, Debbie Larson, the Chinese have lost a lot of their so-called sharp power and soft power because of these uh, not so peaceful strategies for achieving 
their goals. And I think we have to be a wolf warrior diplomacy, for instance. We have to realize that this is not a, uh, a game that is going to end anytime soon, but obviously uh, the Chinese, unless they can transform the region into something better, of course, the higher level of Chinese thinking is the Tianxia model, the tributary model. But my sense is even the weakest countries in these regions will have a great tough, tough time accepting that kind of a tributary system if it involves uh, this um, indebtedness and de debt strategies that Chinese are implementing. So they are exposing too much, I think. And I think uh, allowing other great powers to enter the domain. So as long as we can get a better outcome, that, that's what I mean, if they can produce better infrastructure, better domestic structures, better capabilities for states, making weak states stronger, that may be a peaceful outcome, but what the Chinese are doing now, I do not consider as, as, as part of the mix that we discuss in the volume, at least. Hopefully that could be discussed further in other contexts. Um, thank you, TV. Alexander, Deputy, you wanna jump in on this question? We still have like a minute left. No, I think uh, TV did a great job. I couldn't agree more, I couldn't have a better impact. But I would say going back to the point that uh, Debbie mentioned a moment ago, and she was saying, you know, that the US has to essentially get its own house in order. And I, I fully agree, but I would also say, because there's a certain uh, tendency to assume in countries like Canada, that it's all the fault of the US. Uh, and we don't have to do any, you know, a housekeeping of our own. And I would argue that that is a larger problem for a number of so-called established liberal democracies, because I think we have, and the pandemic has perhaps revealed uh, more than ever before, before we have the, our own crisis, before, before uh, we have our own areas where we have the liberal project has failed to deliver massive inequalities, uh, massive problems of historical uh, injustice. Um, again, Canada is an example, but it's not the only one. And I think unless and until we do so, uh, we are going to, to face a huge problem of credibility vis-a-vis, uh, -vis. and this will actually fuel arguments such as those by China and by Russia saying, see, they are in no way better than we are in terms of our system of governance. Um, and I fully agree that, that China has a number of forms of credibility around the world for all the reasons that have been mentioned before. But I would argue, uh, I think that there are still areas where it is winning much more support than we would expect, particularly when it is helping unaccountable regimes stay in power. That is a strategy pursued by Viktor Orban, who is opening the first public Chinese university in Budapest, having kicked out the Central European University, which was too liberal for his taste. He's opening Hungary to Chinese financing as a way to avoid the potential sanctions coming from the European Union. And he is not, if you will, under domestic pressure because he has effectively mobilized public media as well as uh, did the judiciary and he's using those institutions a to support uh, his power and b to conceal the reality of chinese influence from the hungarian public which means that he's getting away with far less pressure than we would assume according to democratic peace theory because those constraints domestic constraints are not there so i would caution i uh, in in that respect i think the story is more fascinating but also more complicated thank you well, thank you to all our panelists for joining us today on a very interesting discussion on uh, the Oxford Handbook on Peaceful Change and uh, International Relations. And thank you to the audience for joining us. I know we left uh, some questions on the table. I will pass those along to the panelists. Um, and hopefully we'll see you back uh, next week uh, for our final um, seminar of the academic year. Uh, Professor Paul, Professor Getchu, Professor Larson, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, um, uh, here at Stanford CSAC, we, we really appreciate you participating in the seminar this week. Thank you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.